We have two scriptures for this morning, and they both come from the book of Exodus, the second book in your Bible. The first comes from Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. The Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them along the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, so that they might travel by day and by night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. And then we jump to the end of the book of Exodus, and we read from chapter 40, verse 17, and then 34 through 38, which is the end of the book of Exodus. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was set up. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the Israelites would set out on each stage of their journey. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and fire was in the cloud by night, before the eyes of all the house of Israel at each stage of their journey. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, I don't know about you, but I feel like a lot of us take for granted what we can do with an app like Google Maps. I will admit that I have a terrible sense of direction. I also have this thing that happens when I get in a car where I just kind of blank out, at least as far as directions. I, I consider myself a safe driver, although that's something like 80% of us believe we are above average drivers, which is statistically impossible. But I consider myself to be a safe driver, but I don't really pay attention when I am driving a route, particularly if I'm going someplace new. I've been out to the uh, United Methodist Summer Camp from here, which is about 45 minutes away. There's only about three turns, but I have to have my app open every time I go because I'm just not paying close enough attention to learn the route. But apps like this are incredible for people like me and maybe for you. Uh, you can do pre-planning. You can also do stuff in real time. Did you know that, uh, at least on the desktop version of Google Maps, you can set what day and what time you want to leave or what day and what time you want to arrive? And it will give you an idea of what time you should leave and what route you should take depending on the time of day. Now, of course, if you're like me and you're doing a lot of driving on I-4, I both up north and down to Winter Park and things like that, it's going to give you like a 30-minute window, like to Winter Park during rush hours, either going to take 25 minutes or going to take 55 minutes, but at least then you know it's it's variable. What's helpful for me too is I tend to be a visual person and so I'll use street view to actually look at intersections and know like oh I turn right at the Red Lobster and hopefully they're keeping it relatively updated as uh, buildings and things change but it helps me to see it. I feel more comfortable. Uh, but when I'm driving around, I want as much information as possible. When our, our family is on a trip and Kara, my wife, is navigating, I always ask her, as soon as I make a turn, I say, what's my next move? <laughs> Even if it's like 60 miles down the road, I want to know when am I turning, what direction am I turning, which turn lane should I be in, the left of the left turn lane or the right of the left turn lane, because that's a difference. You might be turning right again. I want to know what exit I'm getting off at. I want to know how far down the road is. And sometimes I ask her for the next two steps, just because for whatever reason in my mind, I think that it would be better if I know that now. She's finally bought one of those things that allows the phone to attach to the dashboard so she doesn't have to keep answering my panicked questions every 30 seconds because I'll just be like, I just want to confirm it was, it was exit 24, correct? And yes, I told you five times already. But even if that is maybe a quirk or a flaw of my personality, I think when we, when we think about life in general, we all want some kind of direction. We all want some clarity of direction. Wouldn't it be great if there were a Google Maps for your life and you could know, like, I can, I can either take this route in my life or I can take this route in my life. Are there tolls or are there not tolls? Is there traffic? Is there not traffic? Are there more turns? Are there fewer turns? You know, particularly as a Methodist pastor, uh, each appointment is one year at a time. Now, I intend to be here a very long time. I want to be here a very long time. My wife and I are saving to buy a house. My wife is a tenure-track professor at Rollins College down in Winter Park. We want to be here 
a long time. But I would really appreciate it if God would give me the Google Maps directions to say, you're not going to be moved for 12 years, 16 years, something like that. And then I can breathe easy and I can make plans. We all want some kind of direction in life. Uh, I listen to a lot of church leadership podcasts and uh, as I'm sure you, you recognize in all sorts of fields, the last six months during this pandemic have been a time of less clarity than normal less clear direction than normal. Even some of these leaders who tend to make very gut-level, split-second decisions, who are able to process a lot of information, gauge risk, kind of parse options, and, and make big decisions about directions, even they are beginning to hesitate or beginning to see that they can't maybe make quite the same long-ranging decisions as they normally like to make because things seem to change a bit at a time, a week at a time, a month at a time. One pastor put it this way, at the beginning of the pandemic, it felt like we were all running a marathon. And so I said, okay, mentally, I'm ready for a marathon. I maybe didn't train for this one, but I can do it. And then a couple months in, we began to see the social activism and, and unrest around the death of George Floyd. And, and then that became a big uh, emotional issue for a lot of folks. I said, okay, it's not a marathon. It's a biathlon, okay? Certainly didn't train for that, didn't sign up for that, but I'll be able to handle that. And then suddenly... All of the West Coast caught on fire, and then the hurricane season went. We're all the way through the letters, and we're going back through letters again. And now we have the election and the Supreme Court, and it's like we're in a triathlon or an Ironman race that none of us signed up for and none of us trained for. You know, COVID is the front of mind, but uh, here's, just, here's just a quick list of some of the things we're dealing with at the moment. We have COVID, the pandemic, which is unprecedented, re really kind of waiting for precedented times to come back, but we have the pandemic. We have uh, intense polarization in the political realm, in the racial realm, in the economic realm. We have the radicalization of politics in our country, but also to a degree in our denomination. Some of you may recall that our denomination was supposed to have a worldwide meeting this year to talk about whether we were going to be one denomination or split into multiple denominations moving forward. But the pandemic delayed that meeting, and it's fallen off the radar for a lot of people, but that is still a conversation we are going to be having within the next year or two. There's a distrust of institutions and systems worldwide. We see that in the rise of populism. We have a climate crisis that, again, has lit the entire West Coast on fire and led Texas and Louisiana and Mississippi to have multiple tropical systems just dumping rain and, and causing destruction. There's upheaval in the world order. For a lot of us, the last 30, 40, 50 years, the United States has been the undisputed number one country in the world, but there are countries that are continuing to rise and continuing to have more influence around the world, which might be unsettling for some. There's the rise of technology and disruption. There are whole fields of professions that are on their way to being obsolete, if not already. And then for me as a pastor, I think about how our world and, and even America is largely becoming post-Christian. There is still an appetite for religion, an appetite for a belief in a bigger plan. I think that's some of the reason that some of the, these conspiracy theories like QAnon are catching on is because people are hungering for some bigger story or some bigger power to rely on. But for whatever reason, people just don't seem to want that to be the Christian God or the gospel anymore. I guess what I'm trying to say is if life feels crazy, it's not just you. Life is crazy. We are dealing with more on our plate than likely any generation has ever dealt with before. Any one of these things may not be bigger than other things that have happened in the history of the world, but all of these things taken together place a strain and a weight on our bodies, our hearts, our minds, and our spirits that we have not seen before. The season to me feels a lot like the Israelites wandering in the wilderness. And when I say that, I kind of wonder what you think of, because the typical image we get in our head is that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years as a punishment for rejecting the promised land. And then you connect that by saying, Pastor, I thought a couple weeks ago you said things like the pandemic weren't a punishment from God. And you're right, I don't believe that COVID is a punishment from God. 
but rather we need to unwind what we think of when we think about the scriptural story of the Israelites in the wilderness because there's actually two seasons of wandering in the wilderness and they're connected they're back-to-back seasons there was no off season but God led the Israelites out of Egypt through the Red Sea to Mount Sinai and then eventually to the edge of the promised land that was not a punishment That was a trek through the wilderness, but that was God leading them to the place where God wanted them to be. That is like the season, I think, that we're in. But then when they got to the promise, and that, by the way, runs from Exodus 12 all the way through Numbers 13. So we have Genesis, then we have Exodus, and we have Leviticus and Numbers. So that period of time stretches even for a long time in your Bible from Exodus chapter 12 to Numbers chapter 13. But then it's in Numbers uh, chapter 13 and 14 in there uh, that Moses got them to the edge of the promised land, sent in some spies to check out the land and see if they'd be able to go in and take it over. And a couple of the spies came out and said, this land is awesome. God is going to take care of us. Let's just trust God and go in and take it over. And then the rest of the spies said, no way, no way, no way. We're going to lose. We're going to get slaughtered. God just brought us here to put us in a trap. And so they rejected the promised land, and the people chose to reject the promised land, and it was at that point that they were then sentenced, essentially, to a punishment of wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. And it wasn't until Joshua chapter 3 that they finally crossed the Jordan. These are two different seasons in the wilderness, and they were for different reasons. One was by the leading of God, and the other was a punishment from God, but they were still in the wilderness. What makes something a wilderness? It's kind of trite, but I went to dictionary.com, and wilderness is uncultivated, uninhabited, inhospitable. It's not significantly modified by humans. And and when we modify something, how do we tend to modify it? We, We tend to modify for safety, for efficiency, and for comfort. And so if it's not significantly modified, it means that things like safety and efficiency and comfort aren't there in the wilderness. There are few paths if any. And even those that do exist aren't uh, cushy, paved roads that are easy to go over. Uh, My first year in college, I took a class, and one of my professors had done the Appalachian Trail that summer. And uh, even though the Appalachian Trail is well-known and well-trod, and there's all sorts of resources along the way, places to stay, places to mail food and clothing and support along the way, it is still a rigorous, rigorous trail. He came in like looking like a skeleton with a big shaggy beard because the trail, the wilderness, had been so difficult. And that was one that was mapped out. Wilderness is hard enough when you know where you're going. But the Israelites in the wilderness, and it's not uncommon for the leading of God in general, to be to an open-ended place, to a destination that God knows, but for whatever reason, hasn't shared with us, at least at the moment. I mean, we think of Abraham. Abraham was called to leave his family and leave his homeland and just start walking. And God said, I will tell you when to stop. And then earlier this summer, we we studied the story of Abraham being called to sacrifice his son Isaac. And even then, God said, start walking and I will show you which mountain to stop and do this at. God has this habit of having an end goal in mind, but doesn't necessarily tell us where we're going. And perhaps that's because God wants to have a bit of control over how we get there. Have you ever said or had someone say to you, don't go the way the map tells you? Particularly if someone lives out in like a rural area, uh, perhaps the map leads you a really terrible way to go or a not safe way to go. Uh, A couple weeks ago, you might recall that there was a ruptured gas line here in town. It happened to be less than a mile from our house. We thought Jesus was coming back in the middle of the night. I'll tell that story in another sermon later. But a week or so later, I just was curious. I'm going to go drive by, just kind of scope it out. And as they should, they had a law enforcement officer sitting there at the end of the dirt road to make sure that no one, you know, went back to where the utility crews were doing their job. So I just kind of played dumb, like, ah, I'm, I'm trying to find my way back to uh, Orange. My, uh, Google Maps says I can just take a right here. And the officer said, well, y- you can if you want to drive through three feet of mud and your car looks pretty clean. I would recommend you turn around. And I took that recommendation. <laughs> Sometimes maps don't lead us the best, safe, or wisest 
way. How many of you have ever been following Google Maps religiously and instead of coming up to a big intersection and turning left at a light, you take a little cut off and then you end up having to sit there and cut across major traffic without a light. It's so frustrating. It's like, just give me the best way to go, not the most efficient way to go. Or sometimes someone says, just hop in the car and follow me because I want to lead you by something. I want you to see something or we're going to stop somewhere on the way. You know, when we're just trying to take the most efficient route, it's not always the best way. And in fact, in Exodus chapter 12, it says when God took the Israelites out of Egypt, it says that they didn't go the shortest route. Because the shortest route to the promised land would have taken them through the land of the Philistines, or at least nearby. And they would have been threatened with war the whole time. And now I believe that God's plan would have won out and God would have led them to victory. But God understood that the people maybe didn't have full trust in him yet. And so leading them by a very dangerous empire, they might have gotten scared and turned around to come back to Egypt. So instead, God led them the long way to try to give them more of a sense of safety and comfort. And so perhaps the message is don't rush the journey. I, I hate driving. I, I hate driving. The only good thing about driving for me is that I get to listen to podcasts. I hate driving. I want the quickest, fastest, most efficient route. But that's not always the best way. If you've ever driven the Blue Ridge Parkway, the point is the journey, right? Rob took a motorcycle trip on all these crazy turns and curves and stuff. The point isn't to get through it as fast as possible. You are there for the experience. Yes, you may be going someplace. You may have an end point in mind, but sometimes the journey is part of the formation. It's part of the experience. And there might be important steps along the way. In fact, maybe you didn't recognize this. When, when, when God took the Israelites out of Egypt... We think in our mind because of Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments that God led them straight to the Red Sea and then through it and then it fell on the Egyptians and blah, blah, blah. But if you actually read the scriptures, particularly Exodus chapter 14, it says that God commanded them to turn back to come to the Red Sea. So they had gone some other way and they actually had to turn around and come back to camp at the Red Sea. Now, why did they do this? The Egyptians did not follow them when they left initially. And so even if the uh, Israelites had gone straight to the Red Sea, the Egyptians would not have followed them. But God said, I want you to turn back, I want you to double back, and then camp out at the Red Sea so that Pharaoh will say to himself, they're wandering aimlessly in the land. The wilderness is closed in on them. Basically, he wanted to make his people look lost to bait Pharaoh into coming out and chasing them, thinking, oh, they're lost. I can just go and get them back. And that's what ended up baiting the Egyptians into the Red Sea. And when the sea closed on all of these Egyptian soldiers, that is what essentially bought them their true freedom. The Israelites, their true freedom. Pharaoh wasn't going to send anyone else out after that. So they had to double back. And then, of course, they stopped at Mount Sinai. Uh, and it says that they were there for almost a year. I mean, I don't know what timeline, if any, you have in your head, but sometimes we think they got there. Moses went right up. They got the Ten Commandments. They came down. They made the golden calf. That was bad. They renewed the covenant, and then they moved on. But they were there for almost a year, 11, 12 months. But what were they doing there? They were forming the covenant, right? God was saying, I will be your God. You will be my people. God gave them the Ten Commandments and then the 603 other laws of the Old Testament. They were working out details about how to live together as a nation. Remember, they weren't really a nation. They were a family that had gone to Egypt, ended up enslaved, and now they were self-governing to a degree. They had autonomy. They needed to figure out how they were going to live together. They had to learn how to live with God. We also read through this section at Mount Sinai the institution of the festivals and the celebrations and the rituals. This is part of how we identify ourselves as a people group, isn't it? I mean, yesterday... SEC football kicked off, and of course I'm thrilled with the result of the Gator game, but even if it had not gone so well, just watching my favorite football team playing on TV brought a sense of normalcy that I haven't felt in a long time. Think about what life would be like if we didn't have holidays, if we didn't have celebrations, if we didn't have rituals, if we didn't have things to look forward to, if we didn't have things to share. You see, these things, they bond us together. And then, of course, God gave them the directions on how to build the tabernacle. And the tabernacle is where God's Spirit would rest and be present with them. 
It took them two to three months to get from Egypt to Mount Sinai. They were at Mount Sinai for almost a year. And then it took them another 11 months or so to get from Mount Sinai to the edge of the promised land. This is a little over two years that they spent wandering in the wilderness, but they weren't wandering, really. They were on a journey with the promised land as a destination, but they were on a journey that was forming them, that was shaping them. It wasn't a journey to be rushed. It was a journey to lean into. And it says from the very beginning in Exodus chapter 13 that this pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, it led them and it never left them. Uh, In Numbers chapter 9, we get a, a more detailed description of how the cloud and fire led them after they built the tabernacle. It says, on the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant. And from evening until morning, it was over the tabernacle, having the appearance of fire. It was always so. The cloud covered it by day, and the appearance of fire by night. Whenever the cloud lifted from over the tent, the Israelites would set out. And in the place where the cloud settled down, there the Israelites would camp. At the command of the Lord, the Israelites would set out. And at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud rested over the tabernacle, they would remain in camp. And even when the cloud continued over the tabernacle for many days, the Israelites would keep the charge of the Lord and would not set out. Sometimes the cloud would remain a few days over the tabernacle, and according to the command of the Lord, they would remain in camp. Then, according to the command of the Lord, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud would remain from evening until morning, and when the cloud lifted in the morning, they would set out. Or if it continued for a day and a night, when the cloud lifted, they would set out. Whether it was two days or a month or a longer time that the cloud continued resting upon the tabernacle, the Israelites would remain in camp and would not set out. When it lifted, they would set out. At the command of the Lord, they would camp, and at the command of the Lord, they would set out. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by Moses. What, what phrase is repeated in there? Okay, so we have this concept of when the cloud is settled, we stay, and when the cloud lifts, we go. But what phrase is, comp- is repeated in there? The command of the Lord. Now, God didn't give them any advance notice. It doesn't sound like God said, all right, we're going to camp here for two days, and then we're going to head out. It was kind of like when you take a kid to Disney. You don't tell them the night before they're not going to sleep. You tell them in the morning. You wake them up and say, today we're going to Disney. Or, you know, wherever you're going to take. Today we're going to Publix. We're going to have a cookie again. Or, you know, whatever it is you want to tell them. You don't give them something to wait for because then they're going to be preoccupied. You just tell them in the moment. But God didn't leave them aimless. It was always at the command of the Lord we stop and at the command of the Lord we move. We might not get the full picture. We might not get an itinerary. We might not be told how long we're walking or how long we're staying. But God was always with them. Now, a couple interesting notes about this method of the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. It, it intentionally contrasts the plagues in Egypt, right? A cloud, a pillar from heaven guiding them in contrast to a bunch of the plagues which seem to come from the sky. The locusts, the frogs, the lightning, the hail, the darkness. Death and destruction came from the sky to those who were disobedient and in opposition to the Lord. But from heaven came help for those who were the chosen people of God. And then also one of the plagues was darkness. It was used to to terrify the Egyptians. And yet through the pillar of fire, God ensured that the people of God were never alone in the darkness. And cloud and, and fire and smoke, it's a repeated symbol throughout the Bible of the presence of God. Just think about some of them. Moses is a shepherd out in the wilderness, and he sees a what? A burning bush. And that is how God speaks to him and calls to him, is through a burning bush. Then we have these pillars of cloud and fire, and then when they get to Mount Sinai, what is at the top of the mountain? There is a big cloud, a big storm cloud with lightning and fire by night. One of the details of the story is that the entire chosen people were invited to come up the mountain. But that storm cloud and that fire cloud, that cloud of smoke looked so scary that the people were like, "Uh, no, we're good. Moses, why don't you go check it out? But there's cloud and fire and smoke at the top of Mount Sinai. And then when they build the tabernacle and dedicate it, it says that the glory of the Lord filled the temple like a cloud. 
And Moses couldn't even go in because the glory of the Lord was so present and so dense. The same thing happened when they dedicated the temple in 1 Kings 8. Solomon prayed this prayer of dedication, basically ribbon cutting for the temple. And the temple was filled with the glory of the Lord like a cloud. And the priests had to rush out of the temple because the presence of God was so like potent in that moment that they couldn't stay there. And then here's one from the New Testament. The, the story of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the disciples receive the Holy Spirit, what appears over their head? A tongue of fire. I'm a little bit embarrassed as a professional Christian whose job it is to study the Bible and know the connections and things. I hope I'm also an amateur Christian in my off time as well, but at least as a professional Bible teacher, it's embarrassing to me that it took me so long to see that the tongues of fire over the disciples' heads were a mini pillar of fire. I used to just make jokes about, oh, they used too much hairspray and their hair caught on fire. No, 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 no. This is consistent in the Bible as a sign of the presence of God. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were a little pillar of fire above their heads saying that God is in you and with you. There's another thing about clouds and fire. They are, they are dynamic, always in motion, right? I'm sure you've all seen time-lapse photos of storm clouds building and then decreasing as they rain, right? Clouds are never static, ever. And neither is fire. We've all watched fire. We've all seen fire. We've all seen video of fire. I've got candles behind me, and they're wiggling all around. I mean, part of the reason why God commanded uh, us not to make idols out of stone or wood or have graven images is because those things are static and they don't capture the true dynamic personality and presence and, and being that is God. We also don't make an image of God because we are the image of God. We are made in the image of God and no matter how long you sat on your couch watching college football yesterday, you are still a dynamic person in motion. Your blood is always pumping. Your, your lungs are always going. We are dynamic and in motion, just like the God in whose image we were made. And even with this semi-permanent structure of the tabernacle, the cloud would settle and then it would lift and then they would follow the cloud and wherever it settled again, they would settle there for a time. It was a, it was a mobile, dynamic relationship with God. In fact, I think a lot of the unfaithfulness that we see in the Old Testament in the middle to later ends of the Old Testament are in part because the people got a bit too settled in the Holy Land. They got their own city with city walls. They had a temple that was a big structure and God was there and they didn't have to go anywhere. They didn't have to rely on God one step at a time. Have you ever had a season in your life where things got settled? I mean, we all pray for these. We all want these, right? When health is good, finances are good, school is good, relationships are good, or at least passable. And we begin to fall into the temptation of, of seeing God's blessings as something we deserve or something that we've earned or worse, a result of our own effort and work. I even think about driving. Most car accidents happen within a few miles of home because in places of familiarity, our guard goes down. But when you're driving somewhere unfamiliar or in adverse conditions, we pay a bit more attention, right? Have you ever been driving through really heavy rain and, you know, you turn the radio off, you turn the podcast off because you really want to focus on what you're doing? God is shaping the people of Israel through this time in the wilderness. And God is leading them one step at a time, but it says very clearly the pillar of cloud and fire never left its place at the front of the people. And even with the tabernacle, when the cloud lifted, they still followed it to wherever it settled. God was always with them, no matter whether it was a good day or a bad day, a day of movement or a day of rest, a day with direct challenges or a day of peace. God's presence was always with them. In his notes on the Bible, John Wesley writes this, as, uh, and they who make the glory of the Lord their end, and the word of God their rule, the spirit of God the guide of their affections, and the providence of God the guide of their affairs, those people may be confident that the Lord goes before them as truly as he went before Israel in the wilderness. Now, uh, Wesley follows this up immediately by saying, they had it a bit maybe easier in that the pillar of cloud and fire were visible to them, and, and we don't have quite the same you know, very visible sensory experience of the presence of God. But when we are 
aware that the presence of God is always with us and guiding us, we have this same experience. But I sometimes think that we fall into the trap of thinking it would be so much easier if we just had a cloud. Like it would be really great if just when I woke up in the morning, there's a little cloud hovering in my bedroom and I just have to follow that all day. If God would just give me step-by-step directions, just very visibly, we always want more clarity. We always want more direction. We always want more information, particularly from God. But we have to ask ourselves, did it help? Now, certainly it helped. But it didn't stop the Israelites, even in the wilderness, from being unfaithful. Here they are literally day and night, guided by the physical presence of God in a pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. And yet they still grumbled and complained. They still wanted to go back to Egypt at times. They still made a golden calf, even though God directly told them not to. And it just made me kind of brainstorm a list of these things that we are unfaithful to visible things all the time. I think a lot of us have driven 45 miles per hour or 55 miles per hour past a speed limit sign that very clearly says 35 miles per hour. People are unfaithful to significant others, partners and spouses who they either live with or see regularly. People are unfaithful to the ones who gave them the rings they wear on their finger 24-7. People cheat at work while at work We've all made selfish decisions that hurt other people. And we've all at one time or another turned a blind eye to the suffering in the world that is visible before us. But it'd be different if it were God. It'd be different if I just had a little cloud hovering in my bedroom. You know, we think that. But Jesus tells a parable in Luke chapter 16 about the rich man and Lazarus. There's a a rich man and a guy named Lazarus who's a beggar Uh, outside the rich man's home or at the city gates and Lazarus is constantly asking for help and the rich man doesn't help them and then they both die and Lazarus ends up in heaven the rich man ends up in not heaven (laughs) and the rich man uh, says to Lazarus please uh, send someone uh, to my family tell them where I am tell them why I'm here maybe they will turn their life around And the response that Jesus gives is, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Obviously, this parable is functioning on multiple layers because Jesus is, in a way, speaking forward to his resurrection. But he's saying, you know, we think all the time, if we just had a clear supernatural sign, if we just had a little God cloud hovering in our bedroom, we would be faithful to it. But Jesus, the Word of God, God in human flesh, who knows everything better than we do, who knows ourselves better than we do, says, you know, I really feel like we've given you all you need. The Bible and the church and your fellow Christians and the Holy Spirit inside of you. If that's not enough, I'm really not sure a magical floating cloud in your bedroom is going to make that big of a difference. You see, the pull of selfishness and fear and sin is strong. And one of the things that marked the Israelites' time in the wilderness is a repeated desire and even request at times to go back to Egypt. At least there we had good food, they said. They're used to the Nile Delta, where even though they were slaves, they still ate meat and had fresh produce and were living in this lush land. But out in the wilderness, what are they eating? They're eating manna, which, by the way, the Hebrew word manna literally means, what is that? I mean, it was so unrecognizable to them. It's described as little flakes, sort of like crushed coriander seed, which is the seed that comes from cilantro. So I don't know what you did if you had that gene that made cilantro taste like soap. But, you know, you gather up these flakes, and then you had to figure out what to do with it. And they would be making bread, and then maybe they made a manna soup, and then they complained, and God was like, okay, I'll send you quail. And then they even got sick of quail and they're like you know if we could just go back into slavery at least we would have some fresh fruit one of the things i keep hearing is i wish we could just go back to normal wish we could just go back to normal but i guess my question is what do we what do we really want to go back to i I get it i miss eating in restaurants I miss going to movies. I miss movie popcorn more than I miss the movies, but I miss having an excuse to eat movie popcorn. 
I miss going to a Gator football game. I'm not a huge hugger, but at this point I'm starting to miss hugs. I miss a lot of things. But I am seeing in some of us, and even in my own heart, in our rush to get back to normal, we're returning to certain patterns and aspects of our life that just aren't sustainable. We're returning to habits or groups of people or activities that we only ever started because we thought it would look good to someone else and not because it was actually what God wanted us to do. Our calendars are packed again. We're running ragged. And yes, we've had six months of eating dinner together as a family. Kind of annoyed with the family. It'd be nice if we're all off on our own place again. Okay, sure, but in another month or two, we're going to be exhausted again. And some of us are literally putting our health and other people's health in very real danger because we just want normal again. But my question is, what if God can meet those needs inside of us in a new way or a better way if we follow God forward rather than doubling back to a way and a place that God is trying to lead us away from? The temptation to turn back to the familiar is always there. And in times of great uncertainty where there's lack of clarity in virtually every arena of life, it is natural to crave the familiar, even if the familiar wasn't all that great. And so I want to leave you today with a few verses from Hebrews chapter 12 that maybe for us can be our cloud by day and fire by night. The writer of Hebrews writes this, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, which, by the way, may not be the race we signed up for, it may not be the race we trained for, and it certainly may not be a race we would ever have signed up for. But let us run the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him... He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Amen.